And growth is measured by tallying up GDP at the national level and by sales and profits at the company level. And the pursuit of this GDP and profit can be said to be the overwhelming priorities of our national economic and political life. But an expanding body of evidence is telling us to think again. Economic growth may be the world's secular religion, but for much of the world it's a God that's failing, underperforming for most of the world's people, and for those of us in affluent societies, now creating more problems than it's solving. The never-ending drive to grow the overall U.S. economy can undermine communities and environment. It fuels a ruthless international search for energy and other resources. It fails at generating the needed jobs. And it rests on a manufactured consumerism that's not meeting the deepest human needs. Americans are regularly substituting growth and consumption for dealing with real issues, for doing the things that would truly make us and our country better off. Psychologists have pointed out, for example, that while economic growth per person in the United States has risen sharply in recent decades, there's been no increase in life satisfaction and the level of distrust and depression in society has gone up. Before it's too late, we should begin the move to a post-growth society where working life, the natural environment, our communities, and the public sector are no longer sacrificed for the sake of mere GDP growth. Where the illusory promises of ever more growth no longer provide an excuse for neglecting to deal generously with compelling social needs. And where citizen democracy is no longer held hostage to the growth uh, imperative. Having said that, it's also true that even in a post-growth society, there are many things that do need to grow. Growth in good jobs and growth in the incomes of the poor. Growth in the availability of health care and the efficiency of its delivery. Growth in education and research and training. In security against the risks of illness and job displacement, old age and disability. Growth in investment in public infrastructure and in environmental protection and amenity. Growth in the deployment of climate friendly and other green technologies. Growth in the restoration of both ecosystems and our local communities. Growth in non-military government spending at the expense of the military. And growth in international assistance for sustainable and people-centered development for the half of humanity that lives in poverty today, to mention some of the prominent needs. I mentioned jobs uh, first at the top of this list because they are so important and unemployment is so devastating. Likely future rates of economic growth, even with a further federal stimulus, are only mildly associated with declining unemployment. The availability of jobs, the well-being of people and the health of communities should not be forced to await the day when overall economic growth might deliver them. It's time to share the view that government mainly provides safety nets and an occasional Keynesian stimuli, stimulus. Government instead should be seen to have an affirmative responsibility to ensure that those seeking decent jobs find them. And the surest and most cost-effective way to that end is direct government spending, investments, and incentives targeted at creating jobs in areas where there is high social benefit, creating new jobs in areas of democratically determined priority is certainly better than trying to create jobs by priming the pump of aggregate for aggregate economic growth, especially in an era where the macho thing to do in much of business is to shed jobs, not create them. Of particular importance uh, for the new economy are government policies that will slow growth while simultaneously improving social and economic well-being. 
I think, is at the core of this. How do we temper growth and improve quality of life and social and economic well-being at the same time? Well, I think we know a lot of things that could be done. Uh, shorter work weeks and longer vacations with more time for children and families. Greater labor protections, job security, and benefits, including generous parental leaves, recently increased in, in Europe. Guarantees to part-time workers. Restrictions on advertising. A new design of the 21st century corporation, one that embraces rechartering, new ownership patterns, and stakeholder primacy rather than shareholder primacy. Incentives for local production and consumption. Strong social and environmental provisions in trade agreements. Rigorous environmental health and consumer protection, including full incorporation of environmental and social cost into prices, greater economic and social equality with a genuinely progressive taxation of the rich and greater income support for the poor, heavy spending on public services, initiatives to address population growth at home and abroad. Taken together, such policies would undoubtedly slow GDP growth as we measure it today, but well-being and the quality of life, I submit, would improve. I've a, been a policy wonk all my life, so I, I stress these policy issues, but beyond policy change, another hopeful path to a sustainable and just future is to seed the landscape with innovative models. I think one of the more remarkable and under notice things going on in our country today is the proliferation of innovative models of local living economies, sustainable communities and transition towns, of for benefit businesses which prioritize community and environment over profit and growth. The community owned Evergreen Corporation uh, in Cleveland is the wonderful case in point. Uh, growing lettuce, a huge laundry, and a major solar energy installation, all owned by inner city residents in Cleveland. An impressive array of new economy businesses has been brought together in the American Sustainable Business Council and the B Corporation program, and a new fourth sector is emerging, bringing together the best of the private sector, the not-for-profit NGOs and government. And now I want to move a little bit to where Ben was last night. If we are, have any hope of realizing uh, this new economy vision, uh, we will need far-reaching and effective government action. How else can the market be made to work for us rather than against us? How else can corporate behavior be altered or programs built to meet real human and social needs? As I mentioned, government is a principal means available to citizens collectively to exercise their stewardship responsibility and to leave the world a better place. Inevitably, then, the drive for transformative change leads to the political arena where a vital and muscular democracy steered by an informed and engaged citizenry is essential. Yet we, to state the matter this way suggests the enormity of the challenge. The ascendancy of market fundamentalism and anti-regulation and anti-government ideology has been particularly frightening, but even the passing of these extreme, extreme ideas would leave deeper and long-term deficiencies. It is unimaginable, I submit, that today's politics could deliver the transformative changes needed. There are so many reasons why government in Washington today is more often the problem than the solution is hooked on GDP growth for its revenues, for its constituencies, for its influence abroad. It's been captured by the very corporations and concentrations of wealth it should be seeking to regulate and revamp. And it's hobbled by an array of dysfunctional institutional arrangements beginning with the way presidents are elected. 